Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Bethany Peebles. I'm the executive director of the consultation department here at Art Optical, and I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is our third session of the four part specialty lens education series that we are doing with Dr. Stephanie Wu. Um, before we get started, I wanna go ahead and bring everyone's attention to the chat feature. This is where we're gonna ask that you put any questions throughout the presentation. Um, we're gonna hope to answer a few of those at the end of the night. And then if we aren't able to get to those, we'll respond personally to you later on. Um, so with that, I'm going to say, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Stephanie Wu. Thanks so much, Bethany. And thank you so much to Art Optical for inviting me to participate in this super fun education, educational series. And of course, all of these topics are really, really exciting. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites because it's talking about scleral lens success and probably 90% of my practice now is scleral lenses. Uh, so super excited to be here tonight with you guys and I hope that you get something out of this presentation. So just a quick history on, on me, just so you don't, if you don't know who I am, my name is Stephanie Wu. I graduated from SCCO and then I completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And then after that, I went back to Arizona and I joined up into a private practice and we had three practices, two in Arizona, one in California that had no specialty lenses at all, just regular exams, contacts, glasses, uh, post-ops, that kind of thing. And I was so passionate about specialty lenses and I decided I'm gonna grow this thing and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get it to, to, uh, to be successful. So. Essentially, we grew the specialty lens population from zero to over a thousand patients in just a five-year period. Um, I also present a lot of CE on the topic of specialty contact lenses, and to date have managed over 2,000 plus specialty lenses. I own the Contact Lens Institute of Nevada here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it's a fun clinic. All I do are specialty lenses. I don't do primary care anymore. I don't have an optical. My entire focus is on specialty lenses only. I am also the founder of Wu University, which is an educational platform for optometrists and optometry students. We have tons of free COPE CE webinars coming up. If you're interested in that, of course, just uh, check out Wu, Uni Wu University. It's wuu.org and there's a ton of free, really cool, great ones coming up. Tomorrow night, actually, we have one on scleral lens filling solutions, which is such a complement to this type of, of topic as well. So this, the entire night tonight is gonna to be talking about scleral lenses, and in particular, the Ampli, which is the scleral lens from Art Optical. This is a really special lens to me, because I was one of the beta testers for a lot of the different designs. So not only the, the first round of, of Ampli, and actually before it was even called Ampli, um, but then when they developed the smaller diameters, I got to test out the smaller diameters and provide feedback. When they launched the multifocal, I got to be a part of that, uh, higher order aberration control, and all sorts of fun stuff. So this is a lens that I'm very, very familiar with and that I, that I truly, truly like working with. And we're gonna go through a lot of different specifics on Ampli specifically. So just kind of an intro, the Ampli scleral is 16.5 millimeters in diameter. And that's important because there's a lot of lenses out there that if you get the fitting set, it might be super small, so like 14.5 or 14.3. And those lenses are, and they might be great, but it can only fit a certain population. With other lenses, the fitting set starts at like 18.0 or 18.2. And so those lenses are very, very large, which is also great for a subset of, of patients. But uh, sometimes not all the patients can get the lens into their eye successfully because of the conditions they have or the eyelid issues they have. And um, and so I think that anything in the 16 to 17 millimeter range 
is a is a really great option to have as like a workhorse scleral lens. So the 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 complex behind the ample eye or the, the fitting philosophy is that it's meant to vault the cornea and the limbus completely. There are some fitting sets on the market that are technically corneal scleral, where part of the lens rests on the sclera or the um, the cornea or the limbus, and then the remaining is on the sclera. But ample eye actually vaults the cornea and limbus completely, which is about 95% of scleral lens fitting on the market now, which we realize is a much safer option for patients. And it's it's a really great lens. It's it's something that, I mean, I've done hundreds of these fits and there's only four zones that you have to remember, which is great because some of the other lenses that I work with, there's lots of different things that you have to remember and there's lots of different curves and sometimes it can get really confusing so I really like the fact that you really only have to remember four things. So the center, the purple thing you're looking at right now, that's the central vault zone. The next one in that kind of light blue kind of pewter uh, periwinkle color is the peripheral corneal angle. The green is the limbal lift angle and then the dark blue surrounding the edge is the scleral landing angle. So there's only four things that you really have to remember. Looking at it kind of from a different point of view, central vault, that's basically the majority of the lens. So basically the center of the lens when you're evaluating it with the slit lamp um, is, is gonna be the, the majority of that. And then you kind of see how the different zones kind of go out toward the edge of the lens and then it finally lasts on that scleral landing zone. Some of the design features that, that are important to this lens is that you fit the lens based off of the patient condition and not keratometry values. Always check the fitting set, always look at the fitting set and check the fitting guide. That's always the best way to fit not only the ample eye but any scleral lens because the consultants, the company, and all of the beta testing doctors have put in a lot of time and effort to figure out which lens to select based off of different uh, issues. So I really like the fact that instead of just going off of keratometry values, which I don't think are super helpful when you're fitting scleral lenses anyway, uh, you fit it based off the condition. There, something else that is exciting is that there's 150 microns of toric haptic on all of the diagnostic lenses uh, in the fitting set. Now that's important because when scleral lenses were first popular again, you know, 11 years ago or so, most of, of the scleral lens fitting sets had spherical back surfaces. But now with the information that we know from scleral shape, we know that as you get away from the limbus, the sclera actually becomes more and more toric. So 150 is great at a 16 millimeter cord length. It's about 125 to 150 as far as scleral tericity, which is exactly in line with the ample eye. Uh, the different lenses can cover prolate and oblate corneas. And with this type of lens, you're able to help patients that have really bad dry eye and ocular surface diseases. Something else cool is that there's a front toric option. So this is something that a, a lot of scleral lens designs do have now but there are still some scleral lenses that don't have the option to add any front toricity. So you would have to put that in like a pair of glasses on top of the lens beforehand. There's the quad specific control option if you need something like that. And there's the multifocal option. You can also request a different diameter depending on what the patient condition is. So if you need to go higher or lower, it's uh, you're able to do that. It is FDA approved for ocular surface and dry eye disease, which is awesome. Um, I use tons of scleral lenses on patients that have severe dry eye. This is also something that is pretty recent for the ample eye. The, uh, the ample eye can, comes with custom aligned optics now. So instead of just standard optics, 
the alignment shows that it's actually moved toward the superior nasal aspect because scleral lenses are known to decenter down and out. So when you look at the very, very center of a scleral lens and you look at it on a patient's eye, due to the shape of the sclera and kind of the weight of the lens, the most of the lenses are going to decenter down and out. So this is this is also great to help with improved vision. Here's a picture of the fitting set. So really easy to use. There's there's um, nine or twelve uh, lenses for you to pick from, and they're all different shapes, different sags, um, different diameters, and some of the fitting sets. And it's, it's very, very easy to, to look at the fitting guide and know which lens to select. So the ideal patients for ample eye would be patients that have irregular corneas. So immediately, I think of keratoconus patients, pellucid marginal degeneration, any sort of corneal ectasia, post-transplant patients, corneal scarring, post-refractive surgery. It's also good for patients that have corneal gas permeable lens intolerance. So people that come in and they've been wearing GP lenses for a long time, but maybe they complain that the lenses are uncomfortable. Maybe they dislodge all the time. Maybe um, they have issues with getting something underneath the lens all the time, having debris floating around. So that's another patient I would highly recommend considering an ample eye. Patients that have high prescription, so I've got some patients that are like, you know, minus 26, minus 30, those types of people, it's really hard to fit them into glasses that are functional, and also even soft contact lenses, uh, sometimes that can be pretty challenging. Putting them into something like the ample eye can definitely be more of a, a beneficial option for everybody. Of course, anybody that has any sort of ocular surface disease like dry eye would also be a great option. So I really just wanna go over a few things because I think this is so important. Like I said, when I first started fitting scleral lenses, the fitting sets did not have any toricity because we didn't know that we needed that. So basically the shape of the entire lens on the back surface was all one shape spherical. However, we started noticing issues with patients having blanching, patients having tight lens syndrome, patients having extra debris, lens movement, all these other things. So then we got smarter and we said, hmm, maybe we should check the shape of the sclera. And this is important because when you're fitting a scleral lens, the cornea is not involved. It's great you have your topography so you can see what's going on and you're managing the disease and that might kind of help you figure out what kind of lens that you want to select but other than that all of your attention should be on the sclera because the weight of the lens is bearing on the sclera so that's why knowing the shape of the sclera has become so so important when it comes to scleral lens fitting as you can see here on this picture, we're looking at a scleral topography. So this is showing that in the nasal and temporal area, it's usually more flat, which is represented in the color red. And then in the, in the superior and inferior portion, it's more steep, which is represented in blue. And this is, the, this is actually a very typical patient that you will see. So that's why the ample eye was designed to have that torque peripheral curve already in, which I think is why a lot of my first lens success rate is so high, because I'm putting on the lens that is going to be likely what the patient ends up wearing home, uh, which is great. You can even see on this photo, you can see if you put the lens just on a, on a table, you can see how it's kind of lifted up on that on one part and that is because the back surface is not spherical just a quick study to kind of show a little bit more about scleral shape so this was done at the pacific uh, pacific university and basically they took 48 subjects and they measured 
the angles of their eye in different gazes. So they did the scleral angle at 15 millimeters and also 20 millimeter cord length. So this is what they found when you look at someone's eye and you're checking the shape all around, basically from the limbus to that 15 millimeter cord length, and you can see what the angles are. So 38, 37.7, uh, you know, going around, they all look pretty similar, but not exactly the same, right? So we already know, okay, you're not seeing the number 38 exactly all the way around. You're seeing small micro differences. So we already know, okay, the scleral shape is not spherical, but it is quite similar in that 10 to 10 to 15 millimeter cord length. But now look, let's look what happens at what happens when you go from that 15 millimeter to 20 millimeter. Now you really start to get a lot of variability. So you've got your nasal superior angle, which is 36.6, compared to like the temporal inferior area, which is 43.2. So that's a very large difference between one side of the sclera compared to the other. Here's just another way to look at the information. So if you're looking straight on at somebody's eyeball, so let's say the blue circle in the middle is their cornea, and you check the angle kind of going outward, this is what we're seeing. So you can see the further away you get from the limbus, the more toric the sclera becomes. This is just another way to represent the data in a different manner. So you can see, again, limbal angle from 10 to 15 millimeters, it's, relative, it's about the same, still there are some differences. But then when you go out to that 20 millimeter cord length, now you've got all of that variability. So this is telling us that as we get away from the limbus, so as we make our scleral lenses bigger and bigger, you are going to have to account for more tericity. Here's another reason. Here's one of my patients that has, we were just checking on the uh, scleral shape. And we can see here, the red part is representing the cornea. So that's the highest part of the eye. And then the blue part is representing the lowest part. So here you can see on that arrow, this patient ended up having 239 microns of toricity at a 16 millimeter cord length. So this patient is really gonna be needing extra toricity. So this has been super, super helpful uh, with all these different studies, all these different instruments to tell us, hey, when we're fitting scleral lenses, you need to incorporate toric peripheral curves. And some patients may require more than others. The process to fit the ample eye is really simple. Basically, you go from the inside out. Step one, you're gonna look at the central vault and make sure that that looks good. Step two, taking a look at that mid peripheral. Step three, looking at the limbus. Step four, looking at the edge. You wanna make sure that the central vault is between 250 and 400 microns as far as clearance goes. So let's go over how to fit the ample eye scleral lens. So first, you're going to prepare the lens. Next, you will fill the lens with preservative-free saline and fluorescein, like in the photo to your right. You will insert the lens onto the patient's eye, assess the lens fit, remove the lens, and order. We're gonna go through each of these steps now. For lens preparation, you'll select your initial trial lens out of your fitting set, and you'll prepare the lens. All you have to do is clean the lens with a gas permeable lens solution and condition the lens for comfort, and then rinse it off with non-preserved saline. Then place it on your applicator of choice, fill it with non-preserved saline and fluorescein, and insert it onto the eye. This is a kind of list of filling solutions that are currently available. Uh, apologies if I've missed any. I, I feel like there's been like a lot in the last couple years, and, and I hope that I put as many of as I can remember. But for a long time, the only thing we had was on that upper left, you see those pink vials? Those were pretty much the only thing that we had. And if you have your cell phone with you or can take a screenshot of this slide, I'd highly recommend taking a picture of it because 
the text there is exactly how to write the prescription for those vials. It's 0.9% sodium chloride inhalation solution. It's three millimeter vials. They also come in five. I prefer the smaller ones so they don't waste. A tray of 100. And then the instructions are to fill the ocular prosthetic device completely before insertion. And the NDC number is really important because that tells the pharmacist exactly what product you want. There's so many things if you have uh, electronic RX in your EHR system and you type in 0.9% sodium chloride, there's a billion things that pop up. There's gel, there's nasal spray, there's IV bags, there's this, there's that. So this tells the pharmacist exactly what you want. Now you might be wondering, why do would I use this when there's other products available now? Well, good question. So th the reason I still use this is because one, it's really easy for the pharmacy to obtain. Some of these other things um, you have to order online or even if you get them on Amazon or whatever, it might take a while to get it. But this is something that the pharmacy usually always has or can get in a very, very quick amount of time. Also, if a patient has medical insurance, sometimes it's completely covered. So if you have patients that are in a financial hardship or they want to try to save as much money as possible, I would highly recommend writing this for them so that they have it. Um, so I still write this out for all of my patients, even if I'm recommending something else. That way they just have something. And let's say they go on vacation and they're like, oh shoot, I forgot all my stuff. Well, now they have a prescription where they can just take it to wherever they are, whatever pharmacy, and then they can order something for them. Some of the other products that are on the market are, are below. So we've got Lacrapure, uh, which I believe you can get from Art Optical. Uh, there's Sclerophyll, um, and then there's Neutrophil, which is another great solution to fill scleral lenses. Vibrant View Scleral Saline, I think, just launched recently. So those are like some of the um, typical filling solutions. Now. On the right-hand side, Oasis tiers that you see, Refresh, Optive Advanced, and Cellubisc, those are all kind of like liquid gels is how I would describe it. They come in these really small vials, but they're all preservative-free. and That's super, super important to remember. If you're fitting scleral lenses and you're prescribing solution, make sure that you tell patients it has to be preservative-free. So in that column, the Oasis Tears and the Refresh products, those can be added into the bowl of the lens to help patients that have extreme dry eye, maybe they get fogging, maybe they suffer from debris, cha tear chamber debris throughout the day. You might consider adding this into their regimen. Unisol is not available anymore, although I do have some patients that like randomly will find it uh, on the black market <laughs> and then and then purchase it all, but uh, that's not available anymore, which is actually a good thing. Um, and then PuriLens is still available, but the issue with PuriLens is that this bottle is four ounces. There's no way the patient is gonna use one bottle in one sitting. They're gonna use this bottle over and over and over again. And even though it is preservative free, once you open the bottle, it's now contaminated with everything that's in the air, the viruses, the spores, uh, the bacteria, all the dust, the mold. I mean, whatever is in the air is now in that solution. And because it's preservative free, it's going to grow uh, and it's going to become contaminated within 48 hours. So I always highly recommend my patients not use PuriLens. Uh, but again, I guess if they're in a pinch and they have nothing else to use, they can certainly use this, but I would just avoid using it and using the same bottle for weeks on end because by that time it's contaminated. So anything in the vials, these things that you see on the left-hand side are much more conducive to scleral lens patients. Here's a, just a quick video on how to insert the ample eye.
to apply a scleral lens, tuck your chin into your chest and look toward the floor. Bring the scleral lens close to your eye and while controlling your eyelids, gently press the lens onto your eye. When you feel the liquid, that means the lens is close, but continue to push a little more until the lens is properly in place. After, gently let go of your eyelids. If the cool sensation of the liquid causes a blink reflex, you can try placing an unopened vial of preservative-free saline under warm water to increase the temperature of the liquid. Then fill the lens with the warm saline and insert as normal. There's a lot of different ways to insert scleral lenses. So we'll just show you a few photos of a couple different ways to, to do it. So first is a traditional approach, which is basically using the plunger to rest the scleral lens. In this case, you really only have one hand to control the eyelids. You can get something like an O-ring or a dental ring, those orthodontic bands. You can buy a bunch of those on Amazon for like super cheap or Walmart, wherever you buy your things. Um, you can get those super, super cheap. Um, or you can get an O-ring. These are at the hardware store. They're just a little bit thicker and a little bit sturdier than the dental rings. But that helps the patient balance the lens on just one finger. So now she's got the other fingers on her left hand to control the lower eyelid. There's also something called the Easy Eye Applicator. This is something that is like a rubber ring and you put the lens inside the well of, of the device. And again, then now you've got your other fingers to help control your lower eyelid and you've got the, your whole hand to control the upper lid. If patients don't want to be reliant on devices, you can teach them how to insert scleral lenses without anything, and they can do that one of two ways. Uh, one is the tripod, tripod method that you're seeing here where they put it on three fingers. The other way is they can balance it in the crevice of two fingers and put it on. The reason you can't just balance it on one finger is because once you start adding the preservative-free saline, it becomes top-heavy and will fall off. Lastly, if they have a lot of problems, there is a scleral lens stand. There's a few like alternatives out there. I still order mine from this company. I have no financial interest. It's just something that I've used for a long time. Uh, it's called Dolce Adaptives Sea Green. So basically what happens is they've got this plunger and it's actually connected to a light source. They turn on the light and the light is green, hence the name Sea Green. Then they just take their fingers and they're able to use both hands now to control the upper and lower eyelids. And then they just lower their face down to the scleral lens stand. This has been incredibly helpful for many of my patients. We go through these a lot. Um, so in case your patient's having a ton of trouble, this is definitely an option. So after you get the lens into the patient's eye, check the fit of the lens quickly with the slit lamp and find out, okay, this lens has way too much clearance or it's got bearing, got to take it off, put on another one. So you'll just basically repeat that process, cleaning the lens, filling it, putting it onto the eye. So you're just going to keep doing that until you get an acceptable vault. Here's a, a video of just kind of what you'll see with the slit lamp. So the fact that this person has lots of green means that there's plenty of vault in between the lens and the cornea, probably excessive if, if I had to guess. Uh, but at least this person has central vault. When you look and you see like no green or you see areas that are black, then you think, uh-oh, that's, that's touch and you've got to take that lens off and put another lens on. You do want to let the lens settle for about 20 or 30 minutes uh, or longer in some cases. Some doctors will have the patient like leave for four hours and come back in at the end of the day and look at it again. I personally don't do that. I just have, I do everything in the office that same visit, but allow the lens to settle and that will give you a very accurate evaluation so you know how that lens is going to interact with the eye and it will give you a more 
accurate over-refraction. To evaluate a scleral lens, you can evaluate it with a slit lamp, an OCT, or both. A question I get all the time is, do you have to have an OCT to fit scleral lenses? The answer is no. When I first got into practice, we did not have an anterior segment OCT because we weren't doing any specialty lenses. So I had to do all of my fittings with just a slit lamp. So it can totally be done. You may not see things at the level of detail that you would with an OCT, but don't let that discourage you from, from fitting scleral lenses. Make sure that you are following the fitting guide instructions. It's super easy to follow, especially with, with the ample eye. And I do think that the best way to evaluate a scleral lens is inside out. What I mean by that is look at the central vault first, then move your way out to the mid periphery, then to the limbus, then to the edge. So kind of that inside out approach. Some doctors do it from the outside in, but for me, I think the most important thing is getting the central vault uh, acceptable and kind of making modifications to the other parameters as you go. This is what you'll see if you are just using a slit lamp uh, and you don't have an OCT, this is what you'll basically see when you're, when you're looking with a slit lamp. What you'll do is you'll get the slit lamp into a very, very fine optic section. You're going to focus that optic section on the very front surface of the scleral lens. When, the reason you'll know that you are on the front surface of the lens is because it's a very sharp, crisp, edge. If you see that it's kind of blurry, you're not on the front surface of the lens. You need to toggle back and forth until you get right on the front surface. Another way that you'll know is when the patient blinks, anything that's in their tear film, you'll be able to see moving up and down. Uh, so make sure you get that optic section really focused and tight on that front edge. So what you're looking at now is the very, very front edge of the lens is that white band. Behind it, so to the right, you see a black band. That is the actual contact lens thickness. So that is the actual scleral lens thickness. The next thing you'll see is the central clearance, which is the green band. That is the amount of liquid between the ample eye scleral lens and the cornea. And then lastly, all the way to the right, that kind of fuzzy, opaque area is the actual cornea. So this is important because if you don't have an OCT, you need to be able to look at the lens, compare the black band to the green band to find out approximately how much clearance you have. You'll always know what the central clearance is because it's on the diagnostic lens and it's always written down if you do order a lens, it's always written down on the lens order. So let's say the, the lens thickness is 300 microns. Well, if I compare the black band to the green band, I would say that they're pretty equal. The green band may be a little bit larger, but I can confidently say, okay, if I know that this, the ample eye thickness is 300 microns, I'm pretty sure that the central clearance is also about 300. So that's a quick way and, and easy way to evaluate central clearance without an OCT. If you do have an OCT, this is what you're going to measure. What we are looking at first is that yellow arrow. From the very top line, that's the very, very front surface, anterior surface of the scleral lens. And then it connects to the, the other line that you see there, which is the very back surface of the scleral lens. The area in blue highlighted there is the amount of fluid layer between the scleral lens and the cornea. Then lastly, in orange, that arrow is representing the actual corneal thickness. So if you do have an OCT, I'd highly recommend using it if it has anterior segment capabilities because it will help you uh, get your scleral lens fittings a little bit more accurate. This is also incredible information for the consultants because they can see what you see. So if you're sending that, if you're just calling them and saying, I don't know, I'm looking with the slit lamp and I think I see about 300 microns of clearance, but it's actually more like 600. 
then sometimes the consultants, it might, it might take them a little bit longer to get the lens perfected because they're not looking at exactly what you're seeing. But if you send them these pictures of either the lens fit or the OCT imaging, it can be tremendously helpful. I'm sure Bethany can attest to that when she gets images from doctors that have the, the fitting, the OCT imaging and all that information, it's probably a lot easier to troubleshoot compared to somebody that just calls in and is kind of explaining what they think they're seeing. The, the goal is to have complete central clearance. So like in this photo on the left, that's a patient that has complete clearance. You can see it's completely highlighted yellow or green. The patient on the right has central touch. You can see that because there's a big black blob in the middle of the lens. That means that the scleral lens is touching the cornea. You gotta get that off and try another lens. So now we're done with the central fitting. Now let's move on to the limbus. We wanna make sure that we do not touch the limbus at all because there's stem cells there. And that's that could be very, very dangerous, especially if you have patients that have other eye medical issues. So we just wanna make sure that there is full limbal clearance. Here's one of my patients that they the central clearance looks really good, but you can see that black band surrounding the limbus. The, the lens was actually touching the limbus in this case, so not good. Lastly would be the edge. You wanna make sure that the edge basically looks like a well-fit soft lens. The vessels should go underneath the edge of the lens really, really nicely. And you want the lens to not be lifting off and you don't want it to be squishing down. So you want the lens to be basically aligning at the same angle and the same shape as the conjunctiva. So here's a couple photos. So you can see when you look at the edge of the lens, even when you look at some of those small little blood vessels, do you see how they are going underneath the edge of the lens really nicely? We're not seeing any compression. We're not seeing any edge lift. Here's a patient that's got a little bit of a tight edge. And the way you can tell is because the edge is very white, whereas inside and outside of that edge, so around that white ring, it's very red. So we know that in this case, the edge is pushing down way too hard and we need to lift that up. Here's another couple patients um, where you can see that the edge is very, very white. And that means that the edge is squishing down that area. And then this poor patient, not my patient, but thanks to Dr. Denayer for letting me borrow this photo. But here's a patient that this person's eye is really mad. This person's got major compression um, and they've got conjunctival chalasis. I mean, this is a really, really mad and irritated eyeball. So these are just some examples of what you might see with the slit lamp if you're looking at the edge. If you do have an OCT, uh, make sure that you're using it to check the edge. So what we're looking at now, all of that area in white is the actual conjunctival tissue. And then you can see the lens edge almost looks like a little x-ray image there. But you can see how it's landing. Uh, this is one of my ample eye patients. So you can see that the edge is landing really, really nicely on that nasal aspect. You also want to make sure that you note the sagittal identifier. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, I guess, in some of these pictures, but if you can see, like on the left hand side where the arrow is, it says 4,400. So in this patient, it was in the, um, like the three, two, th let's see, so three, four o'clock, 4.30-ish area. And the reason this is important is because that tells art optical where the steep and flat meridians are for the torque peripheral curve. So sometimes I forget this, and when I go to order the lens and I wanna make some changes, they'll sometimes ask me, oh, where was the sagittal identifier? And I have forgotten. This is not the end of the world, but if you do note this, uh, it's helpful. And that's why these pictures are great, because if I forgot to notate it, 
well, whoops, I'll just go back into my pictures and I'll see where it is. So really important uh, for the ample eye, when you're fitting the lens, make sure that you are notating where that sagittal identifier is, because if you need to make any changes to the, to the peripheral curves, or if you need to add some front surface toricity, they'll know where to put it. Here's a couple patients that have um, blanching as well. So you can see kind of, this is why it's helpful. So if you tell Art Optical, you know, I'm seeing some blanching kind of around three o'clock, nine o'clock, they'll be able to help change that toric PC to lift that area up a bit. So after you have figured out you've got good central clearance, you've got good limbo clearance, you've got good edge alignment, um, or at least if you've made notes on the changes you want to make, all you have to do is over-refract and order the lens. If you need help, super easy. Art Optical's made it very, very easy. You can just go to artoptical.com slash help, and there's a virtual consultant there to help improve your fitting. And then lastly, you'll take the lens off. So we'll just show you a video on removal. Be sure to wash and dry your hands before attempting scleral lens removal. Scleral lenses are best removed with a small suction cup. Inspect your eye in the mirror to ensure the scleral lens is in place. Next, moisten the tip of the suction cup with a small amount of preservative-free saline or multipurpose solution. Then, place the suction cup toward the edge of the lens and pull down and out to remove the lens. Be sure the suction is near the edge of the lens and not directly in the middle of the lens. If the plunger is directly in the center of the lens, the lens will be incredibly difficult to remove. If you are having trouble removing the lens in the inferior position, you may try placing it in the superior portion of the lens and pull up and out. Using a twisting motion as you pull can also help remove the scleral lens. Make sure the plunger is making direct contact with the scleral lens only. If the plunger is only partially adhered to the lens, it will not effectively remove the lens. Be sure to walk Okay, so I'd like to present a case report now. So this is a patient that came to see me. Uh, she's 52 years old, white female, comes to the clinic for a comprehensive eye exam. She has a history of keratoconus in both eyes for over 20 years. She wears corneal GPs, but she complains that her left eye dislodges frequently. She states that her left eye sees double, even with her habitual gas permeable lens. She lost her GP lenses a week ago, and she's just been wearing glasses ever since. She just wants to know what all of her options are. With her current glasses, you can see how gigantic of a prescription she has. Lots and lots of sill, and she's seen about 2060 in the right eye and 2400 in the left, so not very good. I performed a manifest refraction and I couldn't get her that much better and there wasn't that much of a change as far as the prescription goes. Slit lamp showed that the eyelids and lashes were clean and clear. She had no stria and scarring in the right eye and she did have scarring and stria in the left eye. She also has a nuclear sclerotic cataract, grade one, and posterior segment was within normal limits. Here's her topography. So you can see the right and the left eye are very, very different. Left eye has a very, very typical keratoconus or pellucid pattern, and that's probably why her vision is so much worse in the left eye compared to the right eye. So we are gonna diagnose it as keratoconus in the right eye and keratoconus slash pellucid in the left eye. And we talked about all the different treatment options. We said, we can keep you in corneal GP lenses. You can stay in glasses, but you're not seeing that great. We could try a hybrid lens. We could try scleral lenses. So after discussing all the pros and cons, and especially because she was somebody that complained that her lens was dislodging all the time, she's already the perfect candidate for a scleral lens. So she opted to just do the scleral lens fit for the left eye, uh, just due to money, she could only afford one eye at, at, at a time. So we decided, let's do the bad eye. That one's only seen 2,400 anyway. So we used the ample eye from Art Optical. 
Base curve 8.04, diameter 16.5, sagittal depth 44. Put the lens on, and I made a note of the where the uh, identifier was there at, at 12 o'clock. You can see my terrible handwriting, but I did make a note of the identifier there. And then we took a look with the OCT. After about 30 minutes, she had about 340 microns of central clearance. The limbal clearance was full, and she did have a little bit of blanching at that three and nine position. With an over-refraction, she's only getting to about 2100, but it's still better than 2400, so I decided to order it. You can use these. This is with the Ample Eye Diagnostic Set. This comes with it, and you can just download it as well super easily. But basically, if you don't have a fitting form or you don't know where to start, just print this off and use this. So you can put down uh, the patient name, your name, what was the diameter, what was the sagittal depth, how long did it settle, and then checking on the fit analysis. So this is super great. A lot of doctors are always asking me, how do I know what to put on a scleral lens fitting form? And Art Optical has already done all that work for you. So go ahead and download this, especially if you have no idea where to start. So the way I order all of my lenses is through email. It's just the way I prefer to do it. Other doctors do all of their or all of their lens orders by calling the lab. Yet other doctors do all of their orders through an online portal, and then other doctors do all of their on their orders through the fax. So there's no right or wrong answer. It's really just personal preference. So I emailed the art optical consultants and said, "Hey, this is what we found. This is what I this is what I'm seeing. Can you help me design and order the lens?" So they ordered the left eye. Basically, we kept the diameter, the base curve, the sagittal depth the same, and all we did was add in that over-refraction. We kept the uh, material at optimum extra, and for me, I always make the left eye a slightly blue tint. So again, here's that same lens coming in, and I just write it down onto the dispense sheet. And with the lens, after settling, uh, she's seen about 2070 in that eye. So that's better than that original 2100 that we saw from the diagnostic fitting. And she still has about 319 microns of central clearance. And then we did an AR over the lenses. And you might be wondering, hmm, why didn't you order that AR or, or perform an over-refraction on this lens? I'll get to that in a moment. So here's the OCT showing us that there's 319 microns in the center. So that's that looks great. Here's some pictures of the edges. So edges look pretty well aligned, might be you know a little bit compressed at the three and nine position, but when I look at this OCT, it looks fine to me. So my plan was. Vision was significantly improved to 20 from 2400. She got down to 2070, and I decided to let her go home with the lenses. We did insertion and removal training in the office, and uh, she came back for a follow up. So, you're probably asking, why did I not try to do an over refraction or incorporate anything in that, in that first visit? The answer is because she had been without lenses for so long, and who knows how warped her cornea was before she got out of lenses before seeing me. And so I don't like to make any changes, at least for a week. I let them wear it, I let them see how the cornea changes over time, and, and then I will, will go ahead and do an over-refraction at the next visit. So now she comes in, left eye's doing amazing. She said she's got great vision in that eye, all of her double vision is gone, and look what happened. She went from 2070 at the dispense, and now she's to 2040. Corneal health looked fine, no significant over-refraction, and now she ended up getting fit into the, the right eye and the ample eye because she loved her vision so much. So this is just a very classic keratoconus case that if you fit any sort of keratoconus patients, you'll see patients just like this. 
if you want more resources, if you're like, okay, I'm, I, I'm doing this, I'm definitely gonna start fitting the ample eye. I wanna know more on like everything scleral lens related. Here's a few helpful resources. The Scleral Lens Education Society is designed to help practitioners fit and prescribe scleral lenses. GPLI, the Gas Permeable Lens Institute, is also a nonprofit organization that is committed to helping doctors fit GP lenses. You can also look at really helpful articles on contact lens spectrum, review of optometry, uh, some of the other major publications can really, really help. There's lots of articles if you just look in their, their archive of all the different articles, tons of articles on scleral lenses. You can also attend in-person meetings if you want to do workshops. I don't know if they're doing workshops uh, this year at Vision Expo, but Vision Expo West will be here in Vegas. Um, and I know ICSC, that stands for the International congress of scleral contacts that's taking place in florida in july and i'm almost positive that they are doing a scleral workshop because so many people have requested it so these are just some helpful resources uh, if you if you need help fitting scleral lenses or want to know more i also can help if if you're interested in more like one-on-one -on -one coaching I am an expert in the ample eye. I can absolutely guide you through and, and communicate with the lab with you, help you with anything that you need. Just visit my website, drstephaniewu.com, click on coaching and consulting. Happy to help in any way if you need any help. There's also a lot of great resources that Art Optical has. So if you go to artoptical.com slash ample eye, lots of cool stuff there's quick fit demonstrations there's the the lens rx calculator uh, i know they even have like a vertex calculator that i use all the time and um, virtual trial set demo so lots of really cool tools from art optical if you go on facebook there is the ample eye fitting forum which i use and i post every once in a while or i answer questions if there's if somebody has it has a question uh, so that just kind of provides like a group of people that are working with the same lens. Uh, I also founded a Facebook group called Business of Scleral Lenses, and that's been really helpful for doctors that have questions more about the practice management aspect, you know, fee setting, um, scheduling patients, what to do in different situations. And then also on Facebook, there's Scleral Lens Practitioners, which is really helpful for clinical related scleral lens questions. If you have your phone handy, you can just scan this QR code right now and download the, the, these fitting tips that I created. So when we were developing this webinar, I talked to Mindy from an optical and I was trying to figure out like, oh, I, I want practitioners and attendees to walk away with something tangible. And uh, since we're doing it virtually, of course, we'll just do it where you can download it yourselves. So I created this document, and this is designed just by me, um, no outside influence at all. This is just something that I wanted to come up with, but basically it just has my personal fitting tips, and this is for basically anybody. I even break down, if you look at the fitting set, what do each of those little acronyms stand for? And I, and I just kind of walk through everything on what it means, why does it matter and how is it beneficial to you and your patients then i kind of just go through a few little helpful tips and tricks that i've learned along the way after fitting hundreds of these of these lenses so please download this um, if you don't have a phone or you you need the link i'm sure mindy or someone else from art optical can email this to you afterwards happy to share with anybody on this presentation if you want some, some more tips. If you have any other questions, I know Bethany's gonna hop back on and, and ask a few other questions, but if you need to get a hold of me, please reach out to me. I am here to help you. Education is my passion. I love teaching doctors about scleral lenses, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to help uh, anytime. So yeah, Bethany, I would love to answer any questions that you guys have. All right, excellent. So yeah, we've got a lot of great questions. So um, we'll hopefully get a couple in at least here. 
Um, so how to pick the best one to start with? Like I said, there's so many. Um, so do you have any special considerations for post graft patients? Yes, good question. So it's really important if you do have a post graft patient, you absolutely have to get an endothelial cell count on them. You don't want to really fit anyone in a scleral that's under 900 uh, cells per millimeter squared. That's really, really important. So make sure that you're getting that done. If you don't have one in your office, just ask the corneal surgeon or uh, some other doctor around you. And you want to maximize the oxygen. So whenever I have a transplant patient, I always order something like Optimum Infinite or Acuity, something that has a DK that's really, really, really high. Excellent. Um, and then do you always do a sphere cylindrical over a fraction? Good question. I personally do, and that's just because with the lens designs now, especially with the ample eye, you can put the cylinder component into the lens if they have some internal sill. And it also helps me identify if there's any flexure. So if I am seeing that it's at that 90 degree axis, as far as that being the steep axis, then I start to think to myself, hmm, is this really cylinder or is this actual flexure? So that's where you can kind of play around with, okay, is the cylinder component matching up with the overcase or the over topography? And that's also really helpful information to the consultant. So Bethany, I'm sure for you, if you see something that comes in with an over refraction and they want to put in some against the rule cylinder, you're thinking something different compared to if it's with the rule cylinder. Right, yeah, excellent. Um, the other thing was when you referred to the, the liquid gel or the preservative-free tears, so not the saline, um, okay. thicker solutions, when you are recommending that, do you have them fill the bowl entirely with that solution or are you recommending them doing kind of a combination? Good question. So I always try having them do a combination, and that's because, number one, those little vials, so the, the refreshed and the Oasis tears, those kind of thicker ones, are, are very expensive. So if the patient doesn't have just expendable income that they can just have no, they have no uh, income issues, which is like nobody, uh, we want to try to limit the amount that they're using it. So I will have them make like a little cocktail. So they'll put like one drop of the Oasis Tears or two drops of it and then fill the rest with their non-preserved saline. Now there are some patients that they have extreme dry eye or they have these conditions where they have to fill the majority of the bowl with something like that and in those cases you just can't avoid it. But for most patients you're going to use like a mixture like a little cocktail between the two. Okay excellent. Um, another good question, um, particularly for those that are not using OCT and they're relying on the slit lamp, does the angle of the beam make a difference in how much you're estimating that clearance is? Yes, it does. So I think most studies show that if you have it off to about a 45 degree angle, that will give you pretty uh, accurate results. If you're going way too far off, you're going to definitely um, over or underestimate the central clearance or the lens thickness, and it's not going to be a good ratio. So I think 45 degrees is what most literature recommends. Perfect. Let's see, why don't we do one more? And um, this one was how um, does it really matter as far as when you, if you do have OCT, does it matter precisely where you're taking the OCT measurement? Do we need to take that into consideration? So are you asking like, does it need to be like directly in the in the center of, of the lens? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. So I think what they were asking is, should it just always be zero to 180? Um, or should we be considering um, a vertical capture? Oh, got it. Okay. Or where, yes. um, you know, where the, the height of that cornea is, is what I believe that they're looking for. Yeah, great question. So uh, in the beginning, I was just doing central clearance, and then I was just doing the nasal and temporal edge. 
But over time now, I will incorporate the superior and inferior edge as well, especially if I have an area of concern. So if the patient is saying, I can feel it right up here, but the rest of the lens is comfortable. Well, I'm going to do some investigating and I'm going to have them uh, look in that area so that I can take a look and see, hey, what's going on in that particular area. So yeah, I have changed my habits now to doing a, a little bit more complete as far as, as using the OCT. Okay. And like you said, I mean, that's such a great tool um, to have. You can really see precisely what's going on, but you don't necessarily need that in order to fit scleral lenses. Um, slit lamp works just as well um, to get started. So that's all excellent. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu, for sharing your expertise. Um, I know that scleral lenses can be intimidating, but they are really excellent to work with and can be really rewarding. So I think this talk was really helpful, um, gave a lot of good tips. So thank you so much. Um, wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. And I do wanna remind you that we do have one more session coming up. And this one I think is a really you know hot topic. We're always asked about this. Um, the next one is on May 19th, and that's gonna go over specialty lens billing and coding. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that, please go ahead and do so. And thank you very much, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks. Bye.